Today's video is sponsored by Delete Me. You've heard the saying, big is beautiful. Well, in the world of modern digital electronics and communications, small is far more important. It's amazing how we take for granted the modern world in which we live today. We expect our internet to work at full speed, our smartphones to give us on-demand music and video in high resolution and play massively multiplayer online games with people we've never met from all over the world in real time and still fit into our pockets. Our world has changed dramatically from that of when I was a teenager. In fact, I, like many others of my age, I'm 62, were the last generation to grow up as a child before the personal computer revolution with no internet, mobile phones, three channels on the TV, no cable television and no computer games. And yet I got my first home computer in 1978 when I was 16 and just a few years after the first modern microprocessors like the 6502, Z80, 68000 and the 88 who had gone into mass production. From that point onwards, the modern world that we know of today had started and things would never be the same again. But to get to where we are today, there had to be a major change in our technology, a point where things really started to get small and without which we would, technologically speaking, still be where we were in the 1960s. If we look at the 20th century, the invention of the triode vacuum tube or thermionic valve took place in 1906. This was similar to a light bulb in that it has a glass tube with the air removed to create a vacuum. But as well as a cathode or heater filament, there was also a control grid and an anode. If you applied a voltage to the grid, a proportional amount of current would flow between the cathode and the anode, creating an amplifier. If the grid was driven hard, then the tube would act like a switch. And if you have enough switches connected in the correct way, you can perform binary calculations and you have the basis for digital computing. World War II was the catalyst that drove the development of electronics and computing. One development in particular was that of the proximity fuse shell. This was like a normal shell that was fired from an artillery gun, but it had an electronic fuse that sent out a radio signal and then would detect the reflection of that signal off of nearby object. The closer the object, the stronger the reflected signal and at a preset distance, the shell would detonate. This was used to great effect against Japanese aircraft in the Pacific by the United States Navy, as well as in Europe to detonate shells above the battlefield to act as anti-personnel devices and continue to be used today. Fitting the electronics into a shell required the miniaturization of vacuum tubes and also making them resistant to the G-forces involved during the acceleration of the shell when it was fired. But the tubes had a limit to how small they could get and they were still quite a delicate object and still quite power hungry. Something that I think few if any people back in the 1980s would have thought about was having their personal details bought and sold by anonymous companies to anyone willing to pay for it. But 40 years on and the digital revolution that many of us dreamed about has turned into a digital nightmare for some. Our dependence on all things digital has turned what was private and confidential into now just another way for big money to be made for the online tech giants. And it's fueled by data brokers, companies that buy and sell data to anyone that wants it. This data can include emails, names, current and past addresses, phone numbers, age and occupation, and much, much more. If your job is in places like the government, the military, civil services, or you have a high profile, this data can be not only a security risk, it can also be a personal safety risk. You can request these companies delete the data they hold on you, but with over 750 data brokers around the world, where do you start? And this is where our sponsor today, Delete Me, comes in. Delete Me has been helping normal people like you and I get their personal information removed from data brokers since 2010 in the US, UK and Europe. Delete Me is simple to use. You just select the plan you want, fill in the online application and Delete Me will contact hundreds of data brokers to remove you from their lists. You receive regular privacy reports that show how much data was found, where it was found and where it was removed. You can do this for yourself or for your family. And if you use the joindeleteme.com forward slash link in the description below or scan the QR code next to me today, 
you will get a 20% discount. So if you value your privacy, check them out now. And this is how things carried on up until the 1960s. Circuits had become more sophisticated, but the components that built them were limited by their physical size. If you look in the back of an old style television set from the 1960s, you will see the components that make them up are quite large. And in an average TV, there would be between 15 and 30 vacuum tubes. The first electronic programmable general purpose computer, the ENIAC, was built in 1945 at the University of Pennsylvania to calculate artillery firing tables for the United States Army and later to study the feasibility of the hydrogen bomb. By the end of its operation in 1956, it contained 18,000 vacuum tubes, 7,200 diodes, 1,500 relays, 70,000 resistors, 10,000 capacitors, and about 5 million hand-soldered joints. It weighed approximately 30 tonnes, was 8 feet or 2 metres tall, 3 feet or 1 metre deep, and 100 feet or 30 metres long, and consumed about 150 kilowatts of power. Its processing power was the equivalent to about 500 flops or floating point operations per second, and was a thousand times faster than other electromechanical computing devices. But to put that into perspective, an iPhone 16 Pro Max has about 2,227 gigaflops of processing power, which is about 445 billion times the power of the ENIAC. One of the biggest problems with the ENIAC was that because of all the vacuum tubes and their reliability issues, it meant that technicians spent a considerable amount of time fixing it. The heaters of the tubes would fail mostly during warm up and cool down periods, but this was greatly reduced with special high reliability tubes after 1948. The longest continual period of operation without a failure was 116 hours or about five days. However, all of this would change with the development of a transistor in 1947, a solid state replacement for the vacuum tube. But it was the way the transistor was fabricated that would allow miniaturization to take off at an exponential rate. The transistor did the same function as a triode valve, but on a piece of silicon just a few millimeters across. This huge reduction in size and weight meant that it was much more robust and used much less power and was of particular interest to the fledgling space industry, and NASA in particular. They needed to put increasingly sophisticated spacecraft into orbit and onto the moon that needed electronic control and computing that would not have been available before. The Apollo moon missions would require computers in the Saturn V rocket to control it, the command service module and the lunar lander in order to perform the calculations to control the craft on their way to the moon, landing on the surface and returning back to Earth. Although much of the heavy lifting calculations were done by mainframe computers back at NASA and the results sent to the spacecraft, they still required computers to carry out most of these instructions. Although the transistor was a huge leap forward by itself, an even bigger leap forward was the discovery that you could fabricate multiple transistors on the same piece of silicon and reduce the size of each one dramatically and this would lead to the first integrated circuits. Now, CPUs of digital computers that NASA would use for the moon missions could fit into something the size of a shoebox instead of a whole rocket. The Apollo Guidance Computer, or AGC, was installed into each command module and the lunar lander to provide computational electronic interfaces for the guidance, navigation, and control of a spacecraft. Although it was the first computer to use integrated circuits, it was a highly optimized design and its performance would match that of computers such as the Apple II, TRS-80 and the Commodore PET, all based on modern CPUs that would come along in the late 1970s, almost 10 years later. The AGC had the processing power equal to 14,245 flops, or almost 29 times that of the ENIAC, the size of a shoebox. The use of those integrated circuits in the AGC kickstarted the microelectronics industry, and many of the early pioneers went on to form companies like Intel, Texas Instruments, and Fairchild. In fact, one of the founders of Intel, Gordon Moore, noticed that the number of transistors you could get onto a chip 
doubled about every 18 months. The more transistors you could fit on the chips, the more operations they could perform, and as the distance between them decreased, the faster they could run. This became known as Moore's Law, not a real law, just an observation that remained pretty accurate up until the 2000s when progress has slowed due to the nearing of the limits of just how small we can make the physical transistors. This ongoing miniaturization for the last 60 years has changed the world in which we live. The first transistors were several millimeters in size. The smallest field effect transistor or FETs in the most powerful CPUs and GPUs today are in a region of less than 20 nanometers. Over the last 40 years, this has led to an exponential increase in computing power, far more than ever could have been imagined back when the AGC was built. With this, we have gradually shifted over from analog electronics, which were dedicated circuits doing one job but could not be changed in the 50s, 60s and 70s, to digital electronics in the 80s and beyond, using general purpose CPUs that could be programmed to do the job required. Things like the digital watch, CD player and games consoles were some of the first mass produced digital systems. When we converted analog signals like music and images into digital information, CPUs could perform mathematical equations on the data and change it in the same way as an analog circuit could do before, such as applying a filter to images or sound effects to audio. And we can now simulate analog processes so well they are often better than the originals. Soon converting anything and everything into ones and zeros became the norm, from music to film to control systems for everything from your central heating to spacecraft. This reduction in the size of components of computers and their increasing power meant that warehouses full of servers have become the new digital factories, processing and storing all the information we generate and is held and processed by the tech giants such as Google, YouTube, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft. And now a new force is emerging, that of artificial intelligence, using not that of the CPUs like we have in our normal computers, but the GPUs, the graphics processing units that we use for making and watching videos and playing games on. Their unique architecture and highly parallel processing mean that my computer, which has an NVIDIA RTX 4090 graphics card is over 40 times more powerful than the top of the range Intel i9-1490 CPU. And it's these hugely powerful processors which have become the highest density chips with the so-called seven nanometer and lower technology and are powering the AI revolution with hundreds of thousands of them running things like ChatGPT and many other AI applications. There is a whole new universe opening up under our noses based on transistors in this mass of data, and most of us know virtually nothing about it. And even if we do reach the minimum size of what is possible, we'll still be able to build them in their trillions of trillions. So thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed the video, please thumbs up, share, and subscribe, and a big thanks go to all our patrons for their ongoing support.